Welcome everyone to our new show called The Quad. The Quad is a show that will bring you women's perspectives from Israel. This is a show that we've been talking about for a long time, but we actually felt that this week, this was a time to start, to show you our unique perspective, hands-on, what's going on on the ground here in Israel. And I'm blessed to be accompanied by some very talented and very good women here on the show. My friend, Emily Schrader, who is a human rights activist and a journalist, Ashira Solomon, a political moderator, and my good friend, Vivian Berkovich, who unfortunately is not with us. She is in Canada. She got stuck there, but she is uh, on our show. And she is the former Canadian ambassador to Israel and the founder of the State of Tel Aviv podcast. Ladies, it's been quite a week. I feel like my life before Shabbat was a different world. And now we're in a different reality. And I don't think I'm the only one who feels this way. There's been a lot of lows this week. And I really, I moved here with my husband. This was before we had kids during the second Intifada. It was March, 2001 and buses were blowing up in Jerusalem and in cafes. And I feel worse now. And I don't know why. Well, I do know why, because I think that the scenes that we've seen are something that we never imagined would happen on our doorstep. This is something that we saw in Boko Haram and in ISIS in Afghanistan and Holocaust scenes. Emily, how's your week been? I mean, it's hard to put into words. <laughs> of course, I think you guys are probably feeling the same. But um, I and, you know, the initial shock of what happened was upsetting. But in the coming days, the, the days that follow the initial attack on October 7th, it's gotten actually worse because we've seen more and more stories coming from survivors. The casualty count has gone up um, over 1,300 now, over 100 hostages. I mean, it's it's insanity. Like if someone had told me that this would happen, I wouldn't have believed it. I would have thought it was like a conspiracy rumor started by, I don't know, the Islamic Republic of Iran or something like that. But it, the nightmare is real. And for the first two days, I remember I woke up thinking it didn't happen. I had yeah. exactly the same feeling. I woke up on Sunday morning hoping it, it had been a bad happen. nightmare. It had been a nightmare. Yeah. I've never had that feeling before. Me either. And I've unfortunately, I've seen terrorist attacks happen in Israel. I've been around some very, very traumatic scenes. Also, you live Not in Tel Aviv, like which means you've been under rocket fire. Yeah. For the best part of the, your time. That's how I was woken up. I was woken up by rocket fire on, on the first Shabbat. day. Yep. On Saturday. So was I. And by the time that happened, all hell had broken loose in the South already. So I picked up my phone. I had like hundreds of messages of people, news alerts and friends asking what's going on and where I am. And very, very chaotic and stressful. It took a couple hours just to even understand what happened. And then the following day in the bar multiple barrage of, barrages of rockets that, that hit Tel Aviv, the one that actually had a direct hit in Tel Aviv was downstairs from my apartment. You're kidding me. And, and that was like, I, I mean, in your building, on your building? My block. In your block. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. What, what, tell us a shelter in your building. Yeah. So I was, I was in the bomb shelter. Of course, whenever there's a rocket siren, I've been in the bomb shelter. And, you know, I, I even in previous operations, I've been under rocket fire before. Um, and you hear the boom from the Iron Dome, like shooting down the rockets from, from Gaza. But what was interesting about this and, and much more scary is like, first of all, the boom was like, tremendous i i would have if i didn't know it was a rocket i would have thought it was an earthquake oh like the God. whole ground shook wow. and initially i thought that my building was hit at least partially because of how severe the shaking was and how loud the noise was and waited a couple minutes in the bomb shelter as you know they tell us to do and then i walked out on the balcony to see if i could see what was hit I looked at the street and the entire neighborhood was smoky. The oh entire God. neighborhood. And you could smell gunpowder from my balcony. I had like the window open. What, floor, the window what open. floor did you live on? Fourth floor. Oh yeah. Tell me, and anybody, was anybody hurt? Yeah, there were actually three people who were injured in that attack. And I, I wa after the coast was clear, you know, I walked down to see where it had happened. And that's when I saw around the corner it had, it had hit. And, um, you know, people were already, emergency services were already coming. There was someone who was trapped under the oh building God. that collapsed. I, I'm pretty sure that no one died in that attack. I didn't get an update, but but three people were injured. And when I walked down and a couple other residents from that block, the, uh, the second wave of rockets came. So people had started to come out. Wow. Then the sirens went off again and all of us right. just booked it back to the bomb shelter. And tell me something, because this is something that I've had a lot of uh, phone calls about. 
Was the bomb shelter in your building prepared? Did it have electricity? Because I've, I've been getting a lot of phone calls of people who are running to public bomb shelters or even bomb shelters in buildings and people have filled it up with their crap instead of being able to be there. Yeah. No, no. I mean, my bomb shelter is my bedroom. So, oh. So in that sense, I'm kind of lucky. Oh, good. So you and can actually I'm... sleep and close the door. Yeah. <laughs> if need be. Yeah. No. Oh, my God. Ashira, when did you move to Israel? I moved to Israel about a year and three months ago. Okay, is this your first war or your second war? This is my first war. I oh, have lived God. in Israel. Th this is my third time living in Israel, but this is the first time there was a war while I'm living in Israel. And you're from California? California, yes. So tell me about your week. So it's been difficult to say the least. And I was actually in Tel Aviv and I'm never in Tel Aviv for Shabbat. I'm very much a Jerusalem girl, but a friend said, let's go and do some Torah in Tel Aviv. So I said, okay. Um, I woke up to two booms and I didn't know what they were. I was yeah. like, is there construction? Is it an earthquake? <laughs> you never know in Tel Aviv. It's yeah. constant construction. Oh, yeah, I like, I didn't know and I'm not used to it. So so you wouldn't even recognize it. I didn't even recognize it. And my other friends were like, oh, sure, those were, there was a bomb. We need to run to the stairwell. And I'm like, what's going on? So I turn on my phone. We're getting all the alerts. Uh, my friends decide to walk to the shul. I'm terrified. They're still going to shul at this they, point? They walk to the shul. Synagogue. The synagogue, yes. And I was like, I'm not leaving my the Airbnb we were at. And I was calling my parents and I was calling friends because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know. But well, you were smart to call your parents because if they would have seen this in t on TV, yeah, I'd not know where you were. Yeah. And as I turned on my phone, my youngest sister, she's texting me, SOS, are you okay? Da -da -da. And I'm like, yes, I'm fine. Um, so it was a very scary situation. I waited in the Airbnb all day for Shabbat and my friends went out. They felt safe to walk. I did not. And then I had to take a taxi to Jerusalem. And I'm never scared to take a taxi. You know, here in Israel, we have a very diverse community, but every driver was an Arab. And I was so scared because I was reading that they're taking hostages and kidnapping. Not only that, they were dressing or they dressed up as police. They dressed up yes. as IDF soldiers. So how do you know? Yes. How do you know? And, and I, so I just... By the third, I had canceled like three rides because I was really waiting for like a Jewish name to pop up. And then I just said, you know what? I just have to take the risk because I needed to get out of Tel Aviv. And I got to Jerusalem and um, I really haven't left my house since. It's been really hard for my parents. They don't understand why I'm choosing to stay in Israel, to stand with Am Israel, to not leave, to not, you know, have us, these attacks make us fear and leave our land. And so my father actually called me this morning and he said, listen, I'm having nightmares and I'm stressed. Oh and he God. just got out of surgery on Friday. Oh. And um, he said, why won't you come home? And I said, I can't. I have to stay here. We can't. I cannot allow them to win. I'm going to stay and stand. Oh just God. as I stand when we're blessed as a nation, I have to stand with the nation when we're in pain. Um, That's incredible, Ashira. So it's been difficult. So like you too, um, I also woke up. My kids actually woke me up uh, with the siren in Jerusalem and as opposed to Tel Aviv, there's barely any sirens in Jerusalem. Yeah, it's not common. It's not common because we have 40% Arab population here. And, of course, the Dome of the Rock. Right. Oh, really? Not that they care about firing rockets at their own holy sites or killing their own people. They no. killed four Arabs in the first wave of attack. Absolutely. Yeah. And they've kidnapped a few. But but I think to, to uh, throw a, a, a rocket onto the Dome of the Rock, they would not be popular in the yeah. Muslim world. Um, and so I think they avoided, even though... Unfortunately, a few days after the first attacks, they threw a rocket and it fell on the mosque of Abu Ghosh. Abu Ghosh wow. is an Arab town, village, next to Jerusalem, on the entrance of Jerusalem. The right. mayor is a good friend of mine, Salim Jabil. Yeah. And I called him up and I said, what's going on? They're a wonderful neighboring uh, town of Jerusalem. And yes, so a, a missile fell on a mosque. But put that aside, I woke up. I didn't know what was going on. It was Simcha Torah. That day, my biggest problem was that my husband actually was in hospital with his father because his father had a very life-threatening infection. So my husband decided to stay Shabbat to get a hotel in Hadassah Hospital. And that was like, that was already our trauma that my father-in-law was in hospital, that, that it yeah. was critical, that my husband wasn't with us for Simcha Torah. My four kids were at home. Little did I know that my that what I thought was my worst problem. Thankfully, my father-in-law's better. Uh, we ran to the shelter, five sirens, never happens in Jerusalem. And at that point, even though I'm Shomer Shabbat, I'm like, God, 
you'll forgive me for this one. Same. That's what I, I said. Open I opened up my phone. Fuck nefesh. Yeah. Fuck nefesh. I opened up my phone, and I and I realized that we that Israel was at war, and then I I put on the news, and this is the worst thing, and I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. The people from Barry, the people from these kibbutzes in the south, were calling the TV to say we are in our houses, we are stuck here, the terrorists are outside, we don't know what to do, nobody's coming to help. Now this is a country that you call an ambulance and it comes in 60 seconds. Right. So I think that for the first two days, at least me, I mean, we've gone through like a roller coaster of feelings here, but for the first two days, disbelief, this could happen to us. Yep. And yes. in this way. Yes. Yep. I've been in absolute shock and the, you know, the stories that are coming out in the aftermath are just making it even Worse. more traumatic. I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine being in that position where you have it. And I saw also what, what you saw, I think, uh, the interviews, people calling onto TV because they weren't able to, you know, I don't know, the RE or the other traumatic. security wasn't able to get, it was traumatic to was listen like, to. I can't even like... imagine being in that position. And, and you know, you mentioned Kibbutz Bay. I think it's important also <clears throat> to explain what we found out about what happened at Kibbutz Bay just yesterday, I think, was when the news really came out about, you know, 12% of their entire population was murdered. Wow. Um, they, families. they burned some of them alive. They tied children together and tortured them. Um, and they murdered uh, at least, the reports say at least 40 babies. They said some, some of them, as well as some of the adults, were decapitated. I mean, it's not just an attack. It's not just cruelty. It's the it's the barbarity. It's, it's like yeah. the depraved savagery, atrocities, yeah. atrocities. Yeah, and and every day gets worse. I just feel that every day gets what what we find out. Yeah, it gets worse every day, and I can't believe we're living in in where we're living in our country as a sovereign land, and we're seeing scenes from the Shoah. I know this bothers some people, and I'm not saying this is a scale of the Shoah. God forbid. Yeah. But the scenes of children hiding in closets for 13 hours while their parents are murdered. Outside, that's yes. Shoah. The, the 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 kids who went to a music concert running and people shooting them in the back like yeah. barrels, like like ducks in a barrel. That's Shoah. Yeah. Not yes. only that, you know, the the police came and they and the police, the terrorists dressed as police came and they blocked roads. I mean, they yeah. knew what they were doing oh, with this they, music festival. They it was pre orchestrated, oh, of course, with the support of Iran. Absolutely uh, premeditated. They I think we also need to beg the question, like, Israel, we have the strongest intelligence in the world. How did this happen? Like, where were the soldiers? Where were the police officers? Why did it take so long? Like you said, if you call an ambulance, it comes in 60 seconds. It's like, what, what happened? What was the but, failure? What was, we have a border. Yeah. Left, and this is what a lot of people don't seem to understand. We left Gaza in 2005, right? They are sovereign. We have a border. Where were we that morning? Yes, like, were we not protecting the border? We are the startup nation. We have the best cybersecurity in the world, the best technology in the world, the best personal security in the world. I think everybody, I think that was the disbelief of the first 48 hours. Right. Yeah. And still, Hello. we don't really have a clear picture still of, of what happened. And I know Israel's focus right now on targeting yes. Hamas, right. ensuring that there isn't further attacks, whether from the north with Hezbollah oh. or from from Hamas or Islamic Jihad in Gaza, but we still don't know. You know, we don't have all the answers and that's an incredibly uncomfortable place to be. And I think you're 100% right. And I think we need to kind of, I know this sounds terrible. I think we need to shelve that until we get over it. Yeah. And the day after, those are the days of the answers. What yes. happened here? But we can't focus on being angry at each other right now. We need to focus on getting our people back, uh, our hostages home protecting our soldiers, you know, limiting the casualties of our soldiers. Yeah. It's going to be a ground invasion and basically helping the country become more resilient. I don't know what else at this point um, we can do. I mean, I think that the response from the international community so far has been pretty supportive. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that really bothers me about it is that uh, no. It's nice that you have, you know, celebrities and world leaders who are expressing solidarity with Israel. But in a way, I'm kind of frustrated because, like, we've been saying these things about Hamas for how long? We've yes. been warning the world about this issue for how long? And Decades. nobody cared. But now that there are dead Jews, now that there are children who have been kidnapped, 
now now you're now you're upset about it like it, it's always easy to mourn when you don't actually have to take an action to stop something right but it's even more than that every we've had this is the fifth war we've had with gaza and every single time when we've wanted to uproot the terrorist infrastructure the world has said no 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 we can't see the images of the destruction in gaza so stop and so we've bought quiet for another year and then again. And the people who have been suffering for 16 years have been the residents of the south of this country. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should look in the mirror and say, well, I was in Jerusalem, you were in Tel Aviv. We didn't, it didn't affect us. Our children right. were not growing up with sirens every month the way that they were over there. Ashira, how do you see this from a perspective of a new immigrant? This is terrible. And I, I think to your point where you said we have more international community supporting, we also still have the international community questioning. They're saying um, oh, yeah. news outlets are coming out and saying, well, we support Israel um, but. responding in an appropriate, yeah. a proportionate amount. Like what is proportionate? So they took 40, uh, they beheaded 40 babies. So what? We only take No, 30. it's even worse now, Ashira, because now they're saying, well, what's the evidence? Yeah. They'll choose, they beheaded 40 babies. Okay. My question is this, does it matter if they were beheaded or oh, burnt yeah. alive or tortured or put in cages and then tortured? Is it, does that make a difference to your sympathy towards us, yes. whether they're beheaded they're or not saying. beheaded? These questions to me are disgraceful. And proving, like, you, uh, like we were speaking about earlier, proving that, uh, how do we know that woman got raped? Oh, yeah, yes. that was another Show me the proof. Yeah. Well, what do you want? Yeah. I mean, what do you want, a pap smear in Gaza? And what do you want? And then even people are questioning, are there really hostages? Did they really take on oh, hostages? Oh, yeah, no, they went voluntarily. Yes, so they just, you know, walked over because they wanted to see the beaches in Gaza. They have this video that was shared with the, I think it was an 85-year-old grandmother. Yes. That yeah. they kidnapped. With a wheelchair, the one in the wheelchair? Yeah, the one in the wheelchair. With dementia? And then they put the mm -hmm. gun over? Gun they made, yeah, they yeah. Made, a, made her take a photo with one of the terrorists, like, you know, making with a B sign. Yeah. A woman they with dementia. They had a video of her. They're parading her, driving through the streets of Gaza, and people are cheering. This is another thing that really upsets me, is that a lot of people are like, well, not all Palestinians. Yes, it's true. Not all Palestinians. But there are enough of them that support this action. There were celebrations throughout the West Bank. There were celebrations throughout Gaza. You and know. I actually feel extra sorry for the Palestinians who really do want a peaceful solution and just want to live in peace. But the reality is that far too many of the Palestinians, as in tens of thousands, support the actions of Hamas. And even worse, the Palestinians in the diaspora are doing demonstrations. Oh, they're having in, huge parades in and concerts. And, and basically, you know, chanting from the river to the sea, they're basically having demonstrations pro-genocide. That's, that's right. what they're doing. Yeah, that's right. And I, I made like a video about this also, like when it comes to the the protesting issue, like you can protest about Palestine. It's fine to be pro-Palestinian. It's fine to have, uh, you know, to, to focus on the human rights of the Palestinians. But to do so within 24 hours, which they did, within 24 hours of a massacre, yeah. of an attempted genocide yeah. of civilians yeah. is madness. Well, they're it's just, absolute madness. They're justifying it like organizations like Black Lives Matter coming out saying we stand in solidarity with them because they have suffered 57 years of oppression, that Israel is a, coloni um, a colonial power, an apartheid state, and um, we have parallels with the black community and a terrorist group. This is insane. Are you kidding me? There are no parallels between Black Americans and Hamas at all. We should not be showing any sympathy to um, a terrorist group. And I want to echo the words that Amari Stoudemire said to BLM, that you are cowards. I will refrain from the curse words he had to say. Uh, he was priceless, by yes. the way. Um, and I do want to urge Black Americans that we have parallels with the Jewish community. We have parallels with the state of Israel. That's who we have a parallel with. We have similar stories. That's who we need to stand with, stand with the Jewish people, unite with them just as we stood with them and they stood with us during civil rights movement. Yeah. Black Lives Matter is a market Marxist organization and it's ran by four women who are queer, which that doesn't matter. But I don't think you could walk into Gaza as four queer women and I'm Hamas saying. would Do be like, know? welcome, we love you. Do they even know? that they would be strung up by their thumbs yeah. if they were in Gaza as queer women. Do they know that? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what you want to stand with. Um, so I think it's 
ludicrous and despicable. I mean, in general, we've had a problem for a while in the extreme left with, uh, you know, bizarre allies of the Palestinians, oh, yeah. including from the LGBTQ community, yeah. that for some reason think that they ha somehow have a shared struggle with the Palestinians, which is completely illogical <laughs> because really like of all, of all the societies in the world, I mean, according to Pew, 93% of Palestinians are completely opposed to homosexuality, as in they think it should be illegal and they should be in prison or executed for it. You know, they it, run it's one of the most signs. homophobic societies Qu in the world. Queers exactly. for Palestine. Yeah. I'm like, okay, you know, I loved, go to Gaza. I love the meme that I saw once, queers for Palestine is like chickens for KFC. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. that, that's the best way to describe it. And, and in terms of Asbara, Emily, because you're really on the front lines of this, how do you, you just said that we have gotten sympathy. Do you feel the mood is shifting? Because I feel it's beginning to. And the question is, what do we do about it? Yeah, I mean, I do think just in the last day or two that things have started to shift a little bit. There's been more criticism, as you mentioned, um, or, you know, questions, the validity of, of different claims. And what do you say about the that uh, Israel is committing genocide now? Yeah, so so this is part of the whole, the whole, campaign that's being launched against Israel. And I think it kind of ties into what I mentioned before, that like people love to feel sorry for Jews in retrospect. Oh, uh, six million died in the Holocaust. How sad. There's Let's a, remember there's the Holocaust. A, there's a fantastic book that everybody should read called Everybody Loves Dead Jews. Uh, yeah, I read it. Well, it's a good it's one. It's a great book talking about how they can memorialize us, make a museum about us, dead Jews. They love that. But when we're right here and now, they can't feel sympathy. Yeah, and when they when we have to defend ourselves, when Israel has to defend themselves, that's when they say, "Oh no, don't do that. Exercise restraint." So how I I beg the question. So what is the, the appropriate response to how Israel should defend themselves? So we get attacked. There's a big, huge terror attack, and what are we supposed to say? I mean, ceasefire. I, I think it's sorry. The, the, we're the power, so you know, we'll let you be. Yeah, I, I will. You know. Military superiority doesn't equal a uh, moral inferiority and vice versa. Right. Absolutely. So I, I think point. we need to really emphasize the point that like the behavior of Hamas, the things that they did, it wasn't a strategic military objective. OK, this wasn't a campaign to take not that it would be OK either, but this wasn't a campaign to take over territory. They weren't coming into Israel to say, oh, that's our land and we're going to free Palestine. That wasn't the point. It wasn't even the goal. Their goal literally was to murder civilians. Exactly. I follow their channels on Telegram, the Hamas, also Hezbollah, and I saw the content that they were putting out in real time. It wasn't them going to uh, fight against let's Israeli take soldiers. Over, let's take over these two kibbutz and we're going to settle them. No. Yeah. They were showing like morbid, disgusting, barbaric murders and celebrating it. They were mocking the victims. They were showing dead bodies. I mean, it's just horrific absolutely horrific cruelty they were even shooting pets they were even shooting people's animals like it's just the, the barbarity is unlike anything i've ever seen except perhaps isis yeah uh, and that is i think what the whole world needs to understand and i i you know i had an interview yesterday and someone said oh well israelis don't care about the fact that hundreds of palestinians are dying i think it's a tragedy absolutely. i think it's absolutely awful and i don't know a single israeli who doesn't that's exactly and that what... doesn't mean we should apologize for rooting out hamas because that what that's what needs to be done not only for us but for the entire world because it's not just about us now this and isn't just coming from from hamas it's coming from the islamic republic of iran absolutely. and they want to expand this I've... and i don't think the international community understands that hamas uses civil civilians as human shields yes that's which right. is which is a war crime yes so they it's not that israel's going in and saying we want to kill innocent children and women no. these are their shields they tell them when israel warns them hey we're going to take out this building everyone leave they tell them to stay that's the reality they of tell the them to stay they use their people they have no value for life of course not for us but certainly not even for their own children but the question is going to be how does israel continue a campaign to dismantle this terrible long, I've been calling them now for three days, the long arm of Iran, yep. because yeah. that's exactly what they are. And it is, as you quite rightly said, Emily, it's not just a threat for us. We're just the first stop on their tour. 
Yeah. Right. And they say it. And in the Hamas charter, it doesn't just say we're going to destroy Israel. They want to kill all the Jews. That's right. Yeah. Let me tell you, the Christian world is next. Yeah. It's not, they're not sparing anybody. They have huge ambitions. Hamas is their uh, puppet, as is Hezbollah in the north. Uh, but now we're going to go in there and we're going to be faced with horrific scenes of war mm -hmm. on the TV and bleeding children, which, like, you're quite right. There's not one Israeli who will celebrate an innocent getting killed or injured. Not, not one, one Israeli. Not one. For us, we want to minimize civilian casualties. For them, that's their goal. Yes. But in the end, the images on TV is what's going to come out. And the question is, how do we get the job done? I think Israel needs to, well, not just Israel, the international community needs to work with Israel. And I think that they, there need to be new opportunities opened up for Palestinians to, even if temporarily, get out. Because Israel is calling the buildings ahead of time. They're giving advance notice before they well, bomb any of the sites. That? Egypt's not going to take Well, but that's what they need to Egypt. pressure Egypt exactly. to do so. Maybe or, that... or the rest of the Arab world. Well, exactly. It's not right. I mean, we, we, have, we do have to protect the civilians as much as we can. And right. Israel does a lot, but we can't do it alone. Right. And we need the rest of the world's help to take out Hamas for everyone's sake. By the way, also the Palestinians in Gaza. They've right. been suffering They're for miserable. years under Hamas. They're right. miserable. And you're quite right. Because look, when we have the, the war between Russia and Ukraine, do you know how many European countries took oh, in Ukrainian yes. refugees? By Russia, the way, we also oh, did. Yes. The Syrian war. You know how many Syrians there are in Europe? So why is it that Egypt, that borders Gaza, something that people don't know. They talk about an open-air prison. They have two borders. One with us, one with Egypt. They're fighting us. They attacked us. They started war with us. They didn't start war with Egypt. Yep. Why can't they? be the country to open a humanitarian corridor. Of course, they've got to filter out to make sure that it's not terrorists coming in and it's not our hostages coming in. Yeah. We can help them with that. But if people are talking about humanitarian aid, why are they asking us, the country that's just been attacked, are we supposed right. to be facilitating <laughs> our butchers to continue to butcher us? Right. Are people Have people gone crazy? I mean, where are these double standards coming from, Emily? I mean, I think a, a core element of it is anti-Semitism. It's true that Israel is held because it's a Jewish state, because actually it's also the only true democracy in the region. It's held to a different standard. It's held to the standard of, you know, uh, democracies who have existed for hundreds of years, like the United States or Canada. And, you know, well, Israel, I believe, shares those values, Israel's a very young country. And on top of all of that, Israel deals with crazy existential threats that none of those countries deal with. Ever not did. to mention non-state actors. Exactly. So we're, we, we've built this country fighting with one hand and building with the other. That's right. And we've turned it into a technological superpower. And we've resolved our, refugee, our own refugee crisis after the Second World War. And on top of that, we're the aggressors when our hand is outstretched in peace including with the Palestinians. What I don't get, and this is something, I've had a lot of uh, panels where the Palestinian ambassador to the UK or here or there comes on the panel. These people are Fatah. These people were themselves killed by Hamas when Hamas got into power. So I find it- After they were democratically elected, uh, Hamas, the people of Gaza chose Hamas and then they murdered their political rivals. They murdered the political rivals. And the political rivals, which is Fatah, they hate each other more than they hate us, right. are now going around the world defending this. What are, we to, what are we supposed to do about this? I think that from our perspective, the best way to do it is to c continue to create content, to continue to be outspoken and have our faces leading and have be educating um, the population. Because so many people are miseducated and disinformed. Non-educated, what's up? Like non-educated at all. And everyone has an opinion about the region and yeah. doesn't know, don't know anything about the region. Um, so I think we need to start with education. I know Emily's doing a great job as a journalist and on social media and with your company. Um, but if, as far as the government goes, I, I, I really have a lack of trust in government right now. And I really have a lack of faith in what they're going to do and how they're going to In perform. terms of security or in terms of asbara, of explaining to the world, where's your loss of faith? In both. In That's both. sad. Yeah, I really have. Right now, I just have a, a huge loss in faith in them. Um, so I think it's going to take 
us civilians, us people on the ground, civil society, to use our own voices, to raise our own voices, to have open dialogue, to have these conversations, um, to really make change and impact. Okay, I want to move over to a segment that Emily and I have been thinking about for a long time. When we, a year, about a year ago, we thought, why don't we do kind of mean tweets type of movie. <laughs> Remember that, Emily? Uh, there's no shortage. If, you, if you're a woman and oh. you speak about anything Jewish or Israel oh. online, If you're a woman and an outspoken Zionist, the misogyny, right? Yeah. Is incredible. But because of where we're at right now, I wanted us to talk about, um, I want to call it um, A-hole of the week. Because <laughs> we want to keep it clean, guys. <laughs> Emily, give me one example of something where you're like, what? You're an a-hole? <laughs> yes. I've got about five. So I know. It's, it's hard to cut down. It's hard, to, it's hard to pick. Yeah. The, the, worst, the worst example of that that you've had. I mean, I don't know if it's the worst example, but the first thing that comes to mind is the scenes that we've seen on campuses. We spoke very briefly about it a, a few minutes ago, but, you know, some of these, these protests, these demonstrations that are supposedly pro-Palestinian are appalling, not just because of the timing, but, you know, in one instance, there was a video from um, Brooklyn College in New York. Yeah. And the Jewish students and allies held a memorial service for the victims of terror. I think it was the day after or maybe two days after the initial attack. Yeah. And you can see in the video that there are anti-Israel demonstrators screaming at them. Some of them are saying this is justified. This was justified. Others are saying, um, you know, free Palestine. And this isn't like an, a, a pro-Israel campaign versus an anti-Israel campaign. This is a memorial service for, for civilian civilians. victims, including children right. of terrorism. And like, so what are you saying with that? Are you saying that that is what the Palestinian cause is? Because that's, that's, exactly that's the message saying. that you're sending but you, when you and protest they, a memorial. And they and they know the message that they're sending. That's what they're saying. But you know what's I've been really like pleasantly surprised how many decent Palestinians have come out disavowing themselves from this? Like, for example, Naz Daly, yeah. who is a massive influencer. Yeah, not yeah. Palestinian. Uh, <laughs> and he, Israeli first now. He wrote a very interesting, very moving message saying, I've always had this kind of dual identity, Israeli-Palestinian, and uh, Palestinian-Israeli, and now I'm, I'm disavowing this Palestinian. This is, they don't stand for me, not in my name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like him, I've seen about another three or four. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Or this is like a minority? I mean, I can't speak for Palestinians. Also, we have to remember that Palestinians in Gaza don't have a lot of freedom. No, they're in no a freedom. tremendously dangerous position. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of the, especially Arab Israelis, I've seen a lot of them speaking out yeah. against this. Uh, Lucia Harish, who's yes. a, a very respected journalist yes. here. A Muslim Israeli herself, she had a monologue during on, on one of Israel's uh, most popular channels. It did the whole thing in English, which was unusual. Yeah, about how like this is a universal cause. This yeah. isn't yeah. something Jewish. This isn't something Arab. This is about humanity. Like humanity. That's it. And and she stated herself, "All of us are united um, against." Sorry, <laughs> against what? No, I'm upset. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Are united against the the horrific scenes that we saw and that it threatens every single one of us. And as I mentioned earlier, the, in the initial wave of rockets, there were four Bedouin Israelis who were killed in almost every wave of attacks from Hamas, even in previous wars. There are Arab Israelis, Arab Muslims who were killed. There are Arab soldiers who have been killed, who are, are defending our country. In the aftermath of this, I saw there was a video that was released. It went semi-viral on social media, but there was a, a huge group of um, Muslim Israeli soldiers who were on their way. They got drafted. They got called up and they were on their way to protect their country. And they were like playing Arabic music really loud. And it's just I think it really, really speaks to Israel's democratic nature and the fact that like, yes, we're a Jewish state, but we're also a democratic state. And these are things that we are willing to fight for and potentially even die for yeah. because we don't have another choice. No. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. What about you, Ashira? A hole of the week. Let's just lighten it up <laughs> just, for a little bit. Just one. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've been saying to people, people are like, how are you? I'm like, if I'm, when I'm not working, I'm crying in a ball in my bed. Yeah, so yeah. that's why I'm working nonstop because that's the only option not to completely collapse, break, not to break, not yeah. to collapse. Ashira, what? A hole of the week. 
It's between Andrew Tate and Instagram. Oh, t- tell me about <laughs> it. Boy. So and- it's Andrew Tate. Andrew sorry. Tate. I'm not a millennial doll. Sorry. <laughs> you don't want to know. Uh, tell me about him. He he's uh, a misogynist and he he's a, but he's sex a, trafficker. Yeah. He, what? Very. Yeah, but he's the most Google man on earth. They what? say. Yes, because he has a very uh, outspoken personality. Right. Um, he recently converted to being Muslim. Okay. And um, he said. You know, how do we know that 40 babies were beheaded? Oh. How do we know any of this footage that's coming out is real? We are all living in a psyop. They're all tricking you. They're all like, you know, everything's a conspiracy theory. Everything is not a conspiracy theory. We live in the country. People live here. Soldiers are down there. They see what's happening. Um, so he is my a-hole of the week. And also Instagram. Instagram has been taking down conservative oh, yeah. um, pages one in particular, Mystery of Jerusalem. They took down her page, Ooh. Mysteries of Jerusalem. Really? She has over 100,000 followers. She okay. She shows the beauty of Jerusalem. She happened to be walking through the old city showing Israel's at war. No one's at the hotel. Just showing. That's all she showed. And they took down her whole Is entire it page. It's not back. So please wow. tell her to speak to me because um, I I have some connections in Meta. Okay. And they've actually been quite good. Okay. about people who they've got some funny algorithm i have to tell you so one day i was also wasn't on instagram anymore and uh i've got some good friends who are running the show in meta israel and they've been very responsive when i've pointed out uh people whose accounts should not have been canceled so please okay, get, get to me on that yes it's happened also to nate nate was i like this somebody actually i helped him it's get back on a few pages yes right now yeah. they're really just it tearing is. him it, down it, i don't think there's somebody there saying oh let's cancel it. i think they've got a, a weird but you know when there was when? with the iran protest oh so tell me my my account got to i had videos removed and at one point my account was removed when we did the protest or when you know at the, the beginning of the masa amini protest was it hard for I you to did. get your account back or uh, I reached out through people who like had connections. Uh, it wasn't easy, okay. but I did ultimately get it back. But then like a day or two later, it came out. BBC and other sources um, discovered that basically the Iranian regime had paid people who were content moderators. Are you kidding me? The, yeah, this was all documented. They had paid people to remove certain people's accounts and uh, content. Related to the Iranian issue. So you think something like this is going on right now? Well, maybe they're using that $6 billion that the U.S. is giving them to pay people. It could be. Well, I want to talk to you about my a-hole of the week, which actually I had about three of them, but this morning topped them all. Oh, boy. I was interviewed by BBC Northern Ireland. And in Northern Ireland, it's very interesting because the Catholics have completely co-opted the Palestinian cause and the Protestants have co-opted our cause. And when I was there a few years ago, I, you know, they showed me these are the, they, they do murals. They love murals. They, they do murals pro-Zionist uh, and then they do, uh, we hate Israel, Palestinian murals. And so I was interviewed this morning. There was a, you know, a debate going on, uh, very pro, very against. And I was then brought in and the head of the Palestinian Solidarity Movement uh, also gets interviewed. And, he's and they're quite extreme. Spitting, oh my God. He's spitting vile, honestly, about everything about Israel. And, and, I, and I asked him a very simple question. I said, can I ask you a question? Do you believe in Israel's right to exist? And he says, I will not respond. I do not recognize this woman speaking. So I, wow. said, so I said, aha, so you don't recognize me as a human being and you don't recognize my country. I think this is the end of the interview. And I put the phone down. Good where, where, how can you have a discussion with somebody who doesn't even recognize wow. your right to exist? Not me as a person. So he wouldn't acknowledge me speaking as a human being. As a human wow. being. And he wouldn't acknowledge my country. So I said, well, the interview is over because there's nothing to talk about. So that a-hole of the week uh, was this morning and it kind of shook me because, I mean, we all deal with a lot, but somebody literally saying to you, I don't recognize, you're right, I don't recognize, I don't, the woman who's talking is, uh, is the, in governance in an occupied city where well, the whole country's occupied to people like him. Right. And that's why I asked him a very simple question. Do you recognize my country's right to exist? And of course the answer was no. And I think that the hidden story behind all of this is that a lot of these protesters and maybe BLM and all these BDS people, they simply don't recognize our right to exist. Yeah. So there's not even a point to open an argument with them. Yep. 
And I think it's crazy because they're so quick to say, oh, well, you're against Palestinians or you're against a Palestinian state. Me personally, I am in favor of two states. I know a lot of people disagree with me. They have different proposals and solutions. Yeah, right. Um, but I don't have a problem with Palestinian self-determination. But even if I did, that has nothing to do with Jewish right to self-determination. It's well, not, they're not dependent on each other and they don't exclude each other. I think it's ironic. A lot of don't get that. I they think don't. it's ironic that we have these social justice warriors for every community. We have it for our black community. We have it for the Palestinians. We have it for the Hispanics. And then when it comes to the Jewish community, no. oh, there's no social justice for uh, no. Jewish people. No, they shouldn't be. So let's end now our show with something of some hope and positivity of something heartwarming in this very difficult, horrific times that we're going through, something that warmed your heart, Emily. Oh, wow. Well, I have to say, I mean, as you know, I've been big on the, the Iranian issue for yeah. a long time. Yeah. Um, the response from the Iranian community has been mind-blowing. The diaspora, the, the Iranian Both. diaspora. Both Iranians inside of Iran and yeah. the diaspora. I mean, they have organized themselves protests in favor of Israel oh all over God. the world oh and where they haven't they've joined the Jewish community oh my in California multiple places in Canada in Lisbon uh, London Paris um, all, all kinds of cities all over in Germany I, I it's amazing I, I'm I'm my mind is blown like seeing the you know the old flag of Iran not the current one of the regime uh, side by side with the Israeli flag. They're doing interviews speaking about how they stand with Israel. Iranians stand with Israel was trending on oh Twitter. And oh, wow, then there's a really? whole campaign in Persian um, of Iranians inside of Iran recording messages of like love and support for Israelis in Persian. And they're sending them to the anti-regime uh, media. You know, they'll they'll draw Israeli flags because they don't really have them Which, there. Which, by the know? way, is pretty brave when they oh, knew yeah. they could get flung in jail, oh, yeah. tortured, and killed. Yeah. yeah. That's an amazing story. Like, these story. people are, are ready to fight for our country. That's oh how God. much they care about Israel. And, you know, the West, uh, I'm an American, too, and I'm happy to see that President Biden was yes. so, so supportive. Yes. But I don't think anybody understands what's going on like the people of Iran. I because agree. they've dealt yeah. with that regime, and that regime is behind this attack. Hamas is terrible. They're a terror organization, but without the 70, 80, 90, whatever billion, million dollars, sorry, annually that they receive from, from the Islamic Republic. And the training and yep. everything else they get from them. People don't seem to understand that. Ashira, yep. please, let's finish with something positive. What's your positive heartwarming story? I have week? two. Okay. I'm always coming with two things. Um, <laughs> as an observant religious woman, I was very warmed at seeing that the restaurants in Tel Aviv started to kosher their kitchens really? so that they could feed soldiers who are religious and keep oh kosher. God. I had no idea. Yes. I didn't know that either. Yeah. And I thought that was so beautiful. And then I seen a video of a man um, going to give food to a soldier and he said, I don't want food. I just want to see. To see. And the man said, I only have the ones that I'm wearing. And he said, can I have them? And he gave it to them. For those of you who don't know, titi is a four corner garment that Jewish men wear. Um, and it has strings on them to represent the 613 commandments. So as we, as a Jewish people, guard the 613 commandments, God will guard us and protect our nation. So it's just been heartwarming to see um, that all the soldiers are getting to seat and putting them on, even if they're not religious, if they're Hillary, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're just putting them on because they're That's Jewish amazing. and they're proud. So. That's amazing. I think that I'm most impressed, and we shouldn't be because this is who we are as a people at the organization, the civil society, just coming together to yeah. organize from hotels yeah. for people from the South in Jerusalem, houses, housing people from the South, from food banks, from sending down even the most basic products um, for soldiers like toothbrushes and toothpaste. The amount of people, I think the whole country involved in doing something for our soldiers, for the cause, for the victims, for the families of the hostages. That to me is Am Israel. This is exactly who we are. And it's coming on the heels of such intense political division. You know, we've had so many debates in the last couple of months. So and to see this for six months, mm -hmm. it's yeah. just, well, you know what? There's really not much positive that we can talk about, but if there's one thing that perhaps has come from this and it's shame on us that it had to take this horrific massacre. Yeah that it has created unity in the country, but we hope this unity stays. 
that we continue, that God continues to protect us, that we continue to protect our soldiers, that we get our hostages back and that this war comes to a swift end and that we end this horrific regime that is set out to do one on one thing only and that is to th- destroy the state of Israel. Am Israel Chai, thank you ladies. Amen. Just want to say that um, Vivian Berkovich is not with us because she is in Canada and the reason she's in Canada, she got stuck there, she was supposed to come back. She is actually organizing an unprecedented campaign to bring back Canadians that got stuck here back to Canada um, and, and doing this all on her own as a, as a private person, not with any help of her government. And she'll talk about that in the next episode. But we miss you, Vivian, and the quad is not a quad without you. <laughs> so thank you so much, ladies, and we'll talk very soon. Thanks. Thank you.